Hey, welcome back to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. I'm Aaron, and this is episode 13. We are really excited today to cover notes. We haven't done that yet, and this is our very first uh, podcast with four people on at the same time. Uh, we are welcoming Ellis San Jose. He is uh, he owns the Note Guys, as well as a co-founder of Four Investor by Investors. That's how I know him out here in California best. Um, and he focuses on a very specific piece of the note buying industry. He has his background in financial planning. Got into the courthouse steps buying and then worked his way into notes and then we have martin signs he is the uh, co uh, the managing partner of bequest funds um, he has also written several books one of them being note investing made easier uh, which is also a website so note investing made easier.com uh, and he works more on a broad scale nationwide on owner occupied mostly distressed uh, notes for sale but in this episode, we cover several things about the note buying business from the localized opportunities to a more national scale, some things that you need to consider from operations to how to structure a deal. Uh, we talk about how the industry has changed over the last year and the last decade uh, as the market has definitely shifted with regulation and after the Great Recession. You won't want to miss this one. Let's get to it. Hey, welcome to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, the podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business using data. I'm Aaron Norris and with co-host Sean O'Toole with Property Radar, and we are very excited to have our first four-way interview, Ella San Jose of the Note Guys and Real Estate 360, and Martin Sines joining us from Virginia with uh, Bequest uh, Funds. Guys, thanks for joining us. Let's start why notes? <laughs> it seems like a secret club that only the very few know about and get into. I love to understand your journey, how you even got here. Well, you know if I, like to, I want to even start a little yeah. bit simpler. What yeah. is note buying? Yeah. So uh, note buying is where you're actually acquiring the debt that is uh, secured by a property. Uh, versus the property itself. So you're basically stepping in as a bank when you're acquiring these assets. Okay, so somebody has a mortgage on their property, a lien of some sort, and um, the the lender or the person that's owed the money says, I'd like my money now, but the note itself says they don't have to pay me off for a long time and, and I want out. So you take them out. That's exactly right. All right, cool. All right. Yeah, I, I tend to look at it like, um, you, you know, you have the you have the mortgage, the security instrument that ties the promissory note to the property. So you have the you have a promise to pay between a lender and a bar given a certain set of terms. So so there is a human factor involved versus maybe like a straight real estate deal where it's just it's just the uh, physical structure. So, so you're dealing with a physical element, the bar, and you're dealing with the security instrument is or the collateral for that, which is the property. Cool. Okay. Well, Ellis, uh, when did you, how did you get involved in note investing? Where did that even start? Oh, gosh, that's a, a, a good story. So I, uh, I used to be a stockbroker and I met a gentleman who was uh, teaching people how to buy real estate and mostly focused on foreclosures. So I took his course and uh, it took me a while, but I eventually had the guts to go out and actually quit my job and, and go in, into real estate full time. And I was knocking on doors of you know people in default and the, those are not very receptive people many times. So I was not having a lot of success. And I was like, well, here I am. I'm not uh, doing very well. And, uh, you know, my wife's getting nervous. So I go back to my mentor and I say, look, I've been knocking on X amount of doors and, you know, it's not happening. He goes, well, why don't you just buy the debt? And I said, w what's that? And so he explained to me that uh, you can not actually buy the debt on a property rather, rather than buying the property itself. So many times I was buying you know, uh, the uh, second or third or you know, junior trustees in many cases for pennies on the dollar. And it, when, when I was in them at that time, the market was so, uh, it was so uh, vital because it was very easy to get loans. This was back in you know, 2001. So I would just sit back and I would get a call from ESCO. Oh, we need to have your de demand because the, this person is either refining or selling. And I would be kind of, you know, ribbing my other flipper friends who were out there really working hard. And here I was just filling out demands and sending them to escrow and getting checks. So it was a beautiful time to be in, the, in that business. Junior liens. Let's do a, a vocabulary check. Uh, right. How about we describe junior liens? Because right. the worst I've ever seen on a property 
five. Five. <laughs> So there's a there's a strata of liens on a property. So you know the, the number one person you have to pay is your property taxes, right? The county always wants their money, and then after that there's a first mortgage, and then you can have a second mortgage. And as you said, Aaron, it could go to five to up to infinite, uh, as many as uh, you know the lender is willing to to swallow. But uh, yeah, so I would specialize in buying the junior liens. Uh, because it's a little bit uh, of, a, of a different quality. They're usually lower dollar amounts. I could, I could, uh, you know, it was much more approachable. And my, my very first uh, lien that I bought was a fourteen thousand dollar second trustee that I bought for eight hundred and sixty five dollars. So it was a very easy entry to learn the business. That's a low. That's a low price point. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was very lucky. I'm going to jump in with just a little bit more vocabulary too, right? Like you just said, trustee, right? And we said loan and liens, encumbrances, right. judgments, like. There's all these different uh, different terms. So, I mean, the loan is kind of the generic term. And in the U.S., depending on the, the title system that's used, right, it can be a deed of trust or trust deed, which basically means when I sell my house uh, or when, when I get a loan, uh, I give the deed, the ownership of the house to a trustee to hold, and they have the right, the power of sale, to sell that if I don't fulfill my commitment. There's other states which use judicial foreclosure where it's a mortgage, which is another term we hear a lot. Mortgage, loan, deed of trust all kind of get used interchangeably. Right. Loan kind of applies to both and then mortgage and deed of trust depend on the, the state. And then we get other types of liens and encumbrances, which... So, for example, I sue you, um, I win money in court, and I get a judgment. Are you guys buying those as well? Um, I, have, judgment? I, have in the past, I have in the past bought judgments. I'm, I'm not super active in that space right now. Okay. So, most of your notes are, were actually loans of either the mortgage or deed of trust variety. Yeah, voluntary liens. Voluntary liens is, yeah, that's the, right. the judgments are the in category. Right? Correct. Forced right. on the owner. A voluntary lien, I borrowed money uh, uh, is, yeah, that's that's another uh, term there. Yeah, good stuff. I don't yeah, when, I, when but, you have a note that's in default, um, you know, you have the option as the lender to <clears throat> go after the bar from a civil standpoint. So, so you're going to go, you know, seek a judgment against that bar. Um, however, uh, for, you know, like Ellis with with our notes, you know, we're always looking for resolution with the bar to keep them in their home or, you know, as we go through the foreclosure route, if we have to. So we're going to go through the property. We're not seeking to um, gain any resolution through the bar uh, by by means of a judgment. So, Martin, how did you get into this side of the business? So actually, when um, my wife and I sold the company in 2013, it was a government contracting company. And from that point, um, like many businesses, I think it's something like 60 percent of businesses that sell, sell, come with some form of, of uh, seller financing. So we took back a business note as a result. And um, right away, we connected with someone in the note industry and we sold a partial tail of that business note to um, to this investor. And so that was really my first exposure was, was uh, that of a note seller. Um, however, I had already uh, been heavily involved with landlording on the commercial and residential side in the DC area. So um, from there, I just kind of connected with some folks in the note space. And I, I went out and bought uh, 10 first mortgage non-performing notes uh, to kind of get things kicked off and and uh, my butt kicked in the process of getting getting it kicked off uh oh yeah. uh -oh. i have a like feeling they were more than eight hundred dollars for the first mortgages yeah it was like a 240k buy and <laughs> yeah. I, I mean i recovered about 80 percent of it but it was it was a lot of pain involved wow i believe that's okay, called so tuition yeah um, now would that have been a, a pool of notes, because that's the other thing you hear about a lot in buying pools versus buying from individuals. Yeah, because a lot of notes are, are sold in the secondary market. So it's post origination. And once it's already originated, whether it's originated as contract for deed or, or through um, a lending institution with Fannie and Freddie underwriting guidelines, 
Either way, once it's originated, it, it, there's transactions that occur in the secondary space, whereas there's buying and selling of these mortgages, both in, perform, in a performing state for the mortgage and a non-performing state. There's different silos that, that um, transact, but yes, pools are purchases, purchased. Um, however, there also are one-offs and individual notes that are that are transacted, but that's more in a retail setting within the secondary space. Do you get discounts on notes that aren't in distress? Um, yeah, sometimes you do. Uh, you know, yeah, sometimes you do. Sometimes, uh, you know, a seller, what's their motivation, right? It, you know, do they need to liquidate? recapitalize for some some need where they can get better returns you know with their money using it somewhere else so you can get people um, that will sell at discounts i purchased a performing note about a month ago and uh for an 18 percent yield so and it's a season first mortgage note so um it happens uh 18 percent i just want to I think there's a little interesting bit of math there, right? So you said for an 18% yield, that's going to be your return. What's the interest rate on the note itself? Um, I don't remember, but I'm thinking it's about seven to nine percent, somewhere in that range. So seven to nine percent, they discounted it enough that your return is going to be 18%. So you know, that, that, that changes the math quite a bit. And I imagine it's also possible, right? If somebody had a note that was at 18% and current rates are four or 5%, they might actually be able to sell at a premium where the face value of the note's 18, but you'll pay a premium for it and get a 12% return or something, right? That in the big picture, at least theoretically that happens, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, buy with the end in mind, right? So when you're buying in pools, you have to look at the interest rates on the loans that you're buying, especially if they're in a non-performing state, because you know at some point when you get those loans modified and they're performing again, they're going to be around the interest rate that is the current interest rate. And, and that's going to give you some guidance in terms of what you're going to be able to sell those for in the secondary space once they're seasoned. So that'll that'll tell you that'll kind of give you your numbers. Let's let's net out like okay, so there's a buy side, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that, and then I'd like to talk about the sell side because you know it seems to me like there's different strategies on the buy sides, buying pools, buying from individuals, etc. And then on the sell side, there's different strategies like you just mentioned. You can season it, get it performing, and sell it for maybe full value, right? Um, you can get uh, Ellis, you mentioned getting paid off and just waiting for the, the title company to call and say, maybe you don't even collect payments in the meantime. So long as somebody calls you someday and says, hey, we're paying it off, you get your return. Um, you could obviously just collect payments until it's over, right? So there's different strategies there. Um, we could want to tackle the buy side first. Yeah, I mean, I can, <clears throat> so... So generally, uh, just kind of like a high overview, when you're buying junior liens that are non-performing in the secondary space in pools, you're generally look if you're buying correctly, you're generally looking at about seven of the 10 loans are going to modify. So the borrower is going to come to the table, you're going to work out terms, they're going to start paying again, or they'll reinstate. So they're either going to modify the, the existing terms of the loan, or they're going to reinstate and catch things up, so to speak. Um, then one out of the 10 is going to for, go to foreclosure. So the borrower is just going to say, forget it, you know, I, I, I need to just move on and, and uh, it's going to result in foreclosure. And then, and then two are going to result in something, something weird, right? Like a, like a payoff or, uh, or they're just going to go through bankruptcy and, and there's no equity and you're going to have some kind of trials and tribulations that way. So one, you might be wiped. So that's kind of like the general rule of thumb when you're, when you're coming in. Now, um, based on the types of notes that we source and, in our in our due diligence process, whereby we focus equal attention to the property valuation and and um, as well as the the title for that property, equal attention from that to also the borrower situation and their ability to pay, we actually end up with pools of loans where we have probably about a ninety percent conversion to loan modification. We foreclose less than five percent of the time, which is exactly in line with the mission for our company which is keeping homeowners in the home with payments they can afford 
while we make a profit for ourselves. And, 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 in about 5% of the time, we're seeing uh, payoffs occur. Now, in the past few years, we've seen a massive uptick in payoffs given interest rates and refis. And Ellis, I'd love to hear you know, what, what he's seeing on, on his side as well. But um, so you can take that and, and use those, those kind of rule of thumb numbers to go and, and create um, uh, you know, return projections for the pools that you're buying. Where where are you sourcing these deals? Who's selling these notes? Uh, hedge funds, hedge funds. So it's um it's a it's a very tight knit community, and you have to really have strong relationships in place that are built on strict trust, past performance, as well as um, ability to close and do what you say. So these take time to develop, and this is why the barriers to entry. Are, are very high doing it the right way. Like you could go and be like, I'm going to be a note investor, take a weekend course and go buy some notes on, on an online exchange. And you can do that in one week. However, to do it where it's, it's a scalable business and done correctly and very profitably over the course of time, you need to have be entrenched with in the community with relationships with large hedge funds that will that, that will um, offer to you and others within a tight circle. Reading your website, it's a sexy mission too. You you purposely try to keep the homeowners in, in the home. So <laughs> it's yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing because that's our most profitable scenario. That's our golden goose. I mean, keeping the homeowners in the home is like. I, I mean, do I want a short term capital gains play? You know, do I do I want to just go and take someone to foreclosure, take their home, displace a family and then and then evict and then take it to auction? No, never. We never want to do that. You know, even if it's like a quick infusion of cash, it, we want 30 year streams of income. That That's all we want, as many of those as we can get our hands on. Yeah. yeah. Ellis, on the so on the sourcing side, um, you know, we know, I know we have a lot of customers that source the individual notes. Are you the same? Are you also looking, you know, buying these larger pools, working with hedge funds, or are you out, you know, buying seller carrybacks directly from the, the seller and, and that kind of thing? Because I know that's another way that people go about this business. Right. So originally I started out buying from seller carrybacks from individuals. And then when the downturn hit, there was so much product available at the institutional level, I could not ignore it. It was just too easy. I mean, you just were trying to throw it in the boat and, and get it. Uh, and uh, so I, I I went into that uh, institutional space. But now I've gone kind of, you know, full circle. Well, I'm back focusing on individuals again with um, – with owner, owner carry back and seller carry back type of notes now. And I, you know, thankfully your product of uh, property rater is so good that it, it gives me a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, great ways to, to source these. Yeah. Aaron has a lot of experience in the hard money business, right? He's going after those folks or they usually go back to their same broker that put them in that note, or you have any luck uh, going in and tackling those folks, the individuals that a hard money broker puts into For for Ellis, that question or yeah, for Ellis, yeah. Well, he, a lot of times there wasn't a broker involved. Believe it or not, that uh, you know that when the on seller, seller carry, carryback stuff, yeah, on the seller sure. carryback, yeah, and, and you know, sometimes that's good and bad. Sometimes you have a very poorly written note that has a lot of problems, <laughs> and you have to clean it up. And then you know it's it gets priced accordingly. Um, right. But uh, you know, I I really enjoy that space because it, uh, you know, I can work directly one-on-one -on -one and solve a problem for a person versus working with an institution where it's like, what's your bid? You know, it's, it, it really comes down to that a lot. I mean, it, it does come to, down to relationships as well, but it's, it's much more of a, I just get much more of a satisfaction in doing it. And, and, you know, hats off to Martin because I could see how the industry was going. And then in order to be a national buyer of notes on a consistent basis, you have to have the right machine. And I had to take a, you know, a, a very, uh, you know, deep look at myself and say, is that what I want to do? And, and that's why I went back to how I started. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a range of, there's a variety of uh, paths here, right? From, a, the, you know, folks who want to just go buy a few um, to a large, you know, becoming a large player. 
Well, Go what's ahead, interesting with Ellis's approach is that, um, and, and that's an area I actually don't have much expertise, the whole seller finance um, you know, sector. But I got to imagine that um, knowing Ellis's expertise, like you're able to have full blown control over that note. So, so you go and buy you, that you can control the flow of how that whole, you know, navigating the the exit from day one. And, and, you know, whereas when you're buying institutional and you're buying in larger pools, you don't always have your hands on everything right. because there's so many other elements that are outside your control. So, right. so I get it. I'm, yeah, on the buy side, what really appealed to me on the individual notes is I have much more creativity. I could buy part of a payment. I could buy, you know, front, you know, just a few payments of a note or the back end of a note. There's so many more options where you don't really have that uh, opportunity when you're buying a pool. It's kind of like, you know, you do your due diligence and then you have to come up with what what's your bid. So, yeah, right, so that's a good, uh, you know, segue. So you know, different ways to find them, go work with hedge funds, use public records to go find these seller carrybacks, you know, et cetera. And now you've got a, a prospect. So the next step is due diligence. Ellis, maybe we should talk about the one I sent you two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's very timely. It is. And it just was a fluke. I just, I yeah. do calls occasionally with people with, and this was a funny situation. You want to, you want to tell that one? Sure, sure. So I got a call. Oh, hey, Aaron Norris, uh, you know, referred me to you. And uh, the situation was there was a foreclosure investor who bought at the steps and uh, there was a holdover owner who uh, was living in the property. And um, because of COVID, uh, well, I think before COVID, she was like, well, you could stay here, pay me some money and, uh, you know, you could stay here temporarily because I think the story was that, that the, uh, the foreclosed homeowner was going to go somewhere else and, and buy something else. Well, consequently, COVID hit and she's just kind of digging her heels and not making payments. And <laughs> the gal says, well, you know, how, how would you like to uh, be the owner of this? <laughs> and I was like, well, uh, that's a, kind of a big problem, especially with COVID, because there's not a clear path to exit like there used to be, right, pre-COVID. Before you had your timelines, you say, okay, if, if they uh, declare bankruptcy, if this happens, there's a certain amount of things that can happen. Um, and, and, and like Martin, when, when I get a situation like that, I like to work it out. It's much more uh, rewarding to figure out a way to keep in the property because, you know, sometimes the worst thing to have is an empty property. Really bad things happen to empty properties. But uh, yeah, so this, uh, this uh, potential seller just wants out. She does not want to be the bad guy and have to, you know, basically pull out the legal, uh, the legal help that she needs to kind of put pressure because there's not a lot of levers to put. And that's a whole other subject about, you know, in California about the levers that you could push to, to secure your asset now. So, yeah. I felt bad for her because it sounds like something I would do. All of a sudden she became, <laughs> she came, became friends with the tenants and basically leased it back or tried yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> which is a, which is a no, no. And yeah, that's a no, no. Interesting. Well, let's talk about how the industry has changed too. I mean, it, uh, First, hypothecation. Uh, before we started recording, I, I talked about this real quick. So there are there lenders out there winning, willing to lend on notes? <laughs> there are. Um, it's not as uh, prevalent as kind of your traditional lending. And, and that's the beauty of real estate is that uh, the exit strategies are much clearer when, you're, when you own the actual real estate. With notes, it get, becomes a little bit more specialized. So there's only, you know, maybe a handful of lenders that uh, – Specialize in saying, yeah, you know, we will use your your notes as collateral and extend uh, credit to you. Interesting. Yeah, I just you threw out that big term hypothecation and yeah, like, we're right, just and spinning we heads around right? on notes. But you know, yeah. so so I got a property. It's got a mortgage, right? Right. I own the mortgage, and then I go get a mortgage on my mortgage <laughs> yeah. as, the, mm -hmm. as the lender, right? right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and on it goes. Not yeah, to be confused with credit lines, people using credit lines to buy notes. Um, exactly. Uh, there's there's not a there's not a big market for for um, lenders of non-performing notes whatsoever. I, I mean, the whoever whoever that would be, there's only a few parties, but whoever that would be, they have you know in-depth knowledge of the industry. So so they know kind of what they're getting into, and they might want cross-collateralization. 
with you know hard assets, property, or what have you to to back up to back up the loan. However, you can collateralize a portfolio uh, portfolio of performing loans and get you know lending that way. That's that's not a problem. However, but when you scale up and you start, um, you know, you show a good track record over time, you can go to lending institutions and get lines of credit out and and uh, work with it that way. But bottom line, when you get started note buying, bring cash. Bring cash. cash. You're, you're, you're not yeah. going to be a wholesaler. You're not going to like, yeah, uh, get a hard money loan in the back end. Like you want to be start, you want to come be a note buyer, bring cash. Bring yeah. cash. But a lot of times people bring Aunt Susie who has cash. So while they're learning. So that's like the big no-no in the industry is, is don't learn on Aunt Susie's dime. And, and, you know, use your own money initially till you know what you're doing. And, and, but you're bringing in equity partners for the most part. And, you know, if you're buying correctly and you're buying at a deep enough discount, there's enough juice in the deal where everyone will do well. Martin, so, yeah, bringing partners is a good, good idea there. Yeah. Was anybody caught off? Uh, I know I got a call from somebody trying to get rid of a pool of mortgages to the tune of 250 million in March after the stock market crashed and they had a margin call. Did you see a lot of people sort of that were posing as cash buyers when they were doing it on lines of credit that have since disappeared? What I saw during COVID, we did, we did, um, we probably purchased about, about $10 million in, in mortgage debt during COVID. And so we went out very hard. We already had some active trades going on that we had to close based on relationships. So we took a big risk. There was a lot of California notes involved in that, in those trades, actually it was about three different trades. And, and so um, we didn't let up. However, what we did see is we saw some sellers more eager to sell and we saw less buyers on the trades because people were holding back, whether it was their capital partners holding back or whatever the case. So it was, it was actually really a heyday during COVID. And I know COVID is still going on. So don't, don't, don't shout at me later, but, um, <laughs> but right now it's the exact opposite. There are twice as many buyers on trades that are going on in the marketplace now post COVID. So that's in quotation marks because everyone's in heat. All the buyers that weren't buying before, they're all pent up. And, and uh, so it's, it's actually a real big buyer's mar uh, uh, seller's market right now. And, and they're getting top dollar for product. Well, that's not fun to hear. Sorry. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> it is. Now, Martin, do you, do you specialize in buying firsts or will you buy junior liens as well? I mainly buy junior liens. I only buy first if I have to. So if it's a mixed opportunity and I have to take down some first. But uh, generally when, when, when I buy first, it's, it's because it was originated as a junior lien and the first paid off or was, was satisfied in some way. So, so this junior lien becomes, you know, moves into the senior position and we'll buy it that way. However, we will not pay any price difference for the senior lien status. We will pay based on junior lien pricing matrixes that we have in place. We kind of stay true to that, but I prefer junior liens well over senior liens any day of the week. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk about vetting a little bit, Ellis. What matters to you as far as the data that you're looking at to know that it's a it's a good deal on these private things? Yeah, I get asked that a lot, and I always say it starts with a collateral. Number one, you have to understand the collateral, what the value is, because that's what's going to pay you off. And the higher you go into you know loan to value, the higher you go closer to what the value of that uh, collateral is, the more the borrowers particular situation play uh, comes into play. So now you have to vet the bar and say, okay, what's their ability to stay? What's their, you know, uh, desire to stay? Is this someone that we can work with to, to, uh, you know, keep them in the property? The, the tougher situations that I've run into is when we we're buying close to the value of the collateral. And then the borrower is also kind of you know, a little sketchy, a little soft. So that's when you start to get a little bit nervous. So I, I always start with the collateral, try to buy as, you know, uh, lowest percentage as possible of the actual collateral value. I'm trying to think of the conversation because 
I mean, it does feel, I mean, I'm in the private money space, but this feels like a secret club. So you're vetting the asset and you randomly call this person and you're not Bank of America. A lot of people just think this, you know, this is a bank thing. So yeah. you're calling, trying to vet the consumer and they're like, who are you? <laughs> What's that conversation? Yeah. You know, what was uh, really great was, you know, back in the downturn, they were happy to hear from somebody because the banks were so swamped and they were, they didn't have kind of the attention that I would have when I spoke to them or somebody in my staff would speak to them is that they actually got a real person. They had their name. They can connect with, I mean, they were so, they're like, oh, I can't believe I have somebody that I can call back to the same person. And um, that's a huge advantage. And as you build trust with them, then they start to say, okay, I'm willing to hear how you can help me. So, um, yeah, I think initially because there's a little bit of resistance towards institutions, I think there's an advantage to being kind of a, 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 you know, an operator that really pays a lot of attention to that, to that borrower and really thinks of many solutions. And I, I have uh, uh, so many creative solutions that we did to help people stay in their homes. It was, you know, it was really satisfying. So do you have a combined loan to value that you stick to that there's just like the do not cross mark for your investments? Uh, it really depends. And I know that's kind of like a, a lawyer answer. <laughs> that but, is a lawyer answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But usually I'm around, you know, I, I, I don't like to go above 70%, you know, um, and uh, and if you're going, you know, further and further down the 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 collateral, like if you're in a second, then it, it start, you start to want to drop that a little bit more because you have a little less control over the, what happens in the, uh, the senior liens. Okay. And, and Martin, how about you, the, on the, on the buy side, how, what data are you looking at? You've mentioned the collateral, but I mean, when you're doing nationwide, that can't be easy. Yeah. So we'll, we'll look at, um, fair market values initially just to kind of get a, a gauge. And I know that right there means what, like we're looking at a number of different da data points, um, you know, online resources, reality track, you know, getting, you know, all, ver various resources, but we're actually a little less concerned on the fair market value. So, so we're, so because we go for fair market value, we want to understand lean validity, ownership, um, and then, you know, so once we get kind of past that, then we're going to go uh, deep dive into credit report um, and, and some other, you know, tools where we're understanding the borrower's ability to pay. And, and so, but at the end of the day, we're looking at cumulative loan to value on the junior lien side. So if, you know, if the first mortgage is at 70,000 and, and our mortgage is at 10,000 as a junior lien, and the property's worth a hundred thousand, then we're at you know eighty percent cumulative loan to value. So we're we're safe that way. So we will buy loans that have full equity coverage. In that case, that's full equity coverage, all the way to partial equity coverage. So if if um, the first is at seventy k, the um, the second's at um, you know sixty k, and the property's worth a hundred k, well well uh, you know thirty k of my sixty k lien is covered with equity, so I have fifty percent equity coverage, and we're okay with that because um, at the end of the day, if we're true to our if we're true to um, um, you know, how we've been trending, we're only going to take back that property less than 5% of the time. So it's, it's almost always going to uh, lead to a loan modification. We're going to change your life when we launch nationally here in the uh, coming days on, uh, on the due diligence side. So uh, you have that to look forward to. <laughs> well, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to extend the courtesy and I'm really appreciative of Ellis bringing me on with you guys. Um, I'm going to have you, I run the largest uh, note investing Facebook group called note investing made easier. I'll bring you guys on to discuss your platform and showcase it for my group. Awesome. Awesome. We, yeah. I'm excited to do that. We definitely, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a small niche market, right? It's a very small part of our overall business, but uh, you know, from the folks that uh, are in your space that use it, and this is one of the reasons we, we you know, we're excited to have you on is uh, you know, they definitely love the uh, service and we've got a small hardcore group of, uh, of you on the platform now. And, and uh, so um, and it's just, it's such a fascinating, you know, thing and, uh, and uh, you know, just note buying that these things are being traded, you know, they're, they are, they're assets, right? In their, their own, own right. Let's talk about some of the, 
the risks, right? You know, we saw a lot of this uh, thing, you know, with people saying that, you know, the note was invalid, like all the way up to the claims that like, well, mortgages aren't real because banks just create the money out of thin air and therefore I don't have to pay it back. Like you get some real, you get some nutters out there on some of these things. Like, and I imagine buying notes occasionally, you're going to deal with some of that. Yeah, I think the risk, I think the biggest risk in our space is, is licensing, is, um, you know, being compliant. Compliance is where things are headed. So it's one thing where, you know, we're a lot of us on the smaller size, you know, we have, yeah, we have some asset managers, we have a team built up. However, we have to stay compliant. So we have to go expend money and, and human you know, it's time and capital to make sure we're compliant. We're getting audited. Our company's getting audited on an ongoing basis, financial audit, not an IRS audit. And, and so you need that and you need bonding and I, all these other requirements in various states. And it's really a full-time job for someone to make sure that you're compliant in all the states. So, but if you don't do that and you go with a nationwide presence that could really hurt you. It's one thing if a bar says, you know, they, they give you a, um, you know, debt validation letter and they're like, prove it. Right. That's one thing. And you're like, you go and you send your collateral in and you ship your collateral to the courthouse and all this other stuff and you prove it. But th there's another thing to say, Hey, I'm actually not licensed to be, you know, pursuing a foreclosure case on, on this note right now. What is that bar? Right. Like, cause you know, I sell you my house and I carry back a note. I don't have to be licensed, right? If I buy that note from that seller, do I have to be licensed? Is there a bar like, and probably varies by state, right? Like it is by state. I remember yeah. something like in California, like it being more than five, but maybe that's on flips. I, I, I don't remember. Do you can, give us an example of what that looks like? And at what point do you have to go through all that licensing and compliance? Well, as you said, and Martin knows better now since he's more exposed nationwide, but, uh, you know, depending on state to state, there are certain states that in many cases, they treat anybody that has bought a institutional note on the secondary market, they treat them just like an, a, a bank and hold them to the same standards. Oh, which, you're, so you're suddenly Wells Fargo. <laughs> yeah. So, so I may have bought three notes in Atlanta and then all of a sudden I have the attorney general saying, where's this, where's that, where's this? And then you're just like, wow, I was going to make, you know, $20,000, but I've spent all of that in compliance, right? So that, that's one of the things you have to be aware of when you're going nationwide. Well, especially when you're dealing with owner-occupied, I mean, you're you're being regulated at the owner-occupied level. It was going to be another, my question yeah. to ask it. So I was asked, I was curious if you were... Like in the state of Florida, I'm licensed in California and Florida. In Florida, you can be licensed as a lender, a broker, or a servicer. Martin, are you are you a, a lender? So it captures the originator bucket and the servicing bucket. So it depends on the state. So so just like give you an example, um, you know we went through an audit, cost us twenty two thousand dollars. It took six months to get, and we paid twenty five hundred to get registered in Illinois for our mortgage license, lender's license. And so if, however, in Ohio, we're registered for our servicing, servicer's license. So various states have various requirements. Um, so, but what I'll say to all that is that it's not, um, it's not that this should deter someone from coming in the space and starting a business for themselves like like Ellis and myself have done. It's just to say that if you're going to do it, you you need to understand the requirements and the resources that are going to need to go behind all this to do it correctly. Because if you shortcut the process, you're going to get caught. at some, It's going to catch you up at some point. Where do people go for that level of information, you know, so you want to start off in note buying, like, you know, I think you mentioned a Facebook group a minute ago, are there clubs, are there, what are, what are the good resources? Where would you point people who want to, you know, dabble in this business maybe, or go after this business? Where, where do they start? Where do they go look for that information? I think the best thing, go ahead, Ellis. No, please. I was going to say, that's why I brought Martin here, because I think he's one of the one of the most uh, professional people I've met at this level that really helps people get from the ground up to, to you know, up to speed. So he's, yeah, he's very good at that. I, 
I have a mentorship program, but I only mentor a handful of people every six months. So I'm not like the go to source for like a Walmart operation for loads of people coming in the space. Um, I would just suggest that obviously over educate, right? Learn as much as you can read the books and everything else. But at the end of the day, I, I believe wholeheartedly you need to pay someone who's successful whatever it need, whatever it takes, whatever they need. If you're very serious and committed to this, um, you know, if you want to go start, you know, selling sandwiches, you're going to go pay 200,000 to Subway and get a building space. You, you're going to learn you take all their systems and do it correctly. So go find someone who's successful in the space. See if their model resonates with you and your objectives and see what you need to do to ingratiate yourself or to, you know, build, build yourself into what they're doing. But it's going to cost you time and money. Yeah. Yep. I, I agree 100%. It is how I got started in, you know, flipping foreclosures, right? I went out and found, you know, a guy who's great. I think he's probably one of the best ever. And uh, I learned a ton from him. And, you know, foreclosure radar and property radar probably only exist because, you know, I met him and, uh, you know, learned the business from him. So, yeah. It's good, good piece of advice. But you have to come with something of value. That's like the note because you get so many people and, and God bless everybody, right? They want right. to be better and do better. And, you know, that's great. Um, however, you have to know that if you're going to come to someone extremely, if people that are doing well are very busy. And yeah. so you have to bring some value proposition for, for, to, for you to catch their attention. Yeah, put your game on. Think about your pitch, your value proposition, what you bring to the table, and and get that down. Practice it with somebody. Even you know, that's a really good. Mentors are important, but you know, getting really good ones takes a good pitch, for sure. I think Ellis is ready for mentorship to to go <laughs> mentor people. I think he. <laughs> yeah. Tell that to my wife and kids. They're like, "Oh, what are you doing now?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, we belong to the California uh, Mortgage Association, which, which is private lender that predominantly uh, focuses on non-owner occupied. But there are people who focus on owner occupied. Um, and then the uh, American Association of Private Lenders, that's put together by Think Realty. Uh, they do a really good job and they really focus on mind-numbing regulation. Honestly, I don't know how I would have stayed compliant because I don't have, you know, there's no in-house compliance and there's not a lot of attorneys and CPAs in the space. Uh, Martin, when we went to go, because going into Florida, we have to have our financial audit every year. It's not, it's what's that $2 and 15 cents and what's the process and procedure around it. This is a really, for me, it's a really important data point because if you want to get in the business and you're growing, if you don't set up right, <laughs> and you don't know how you're going to be regulated. It could be really painful and really expensive. And it's not based always on volume, depending on the state it's triggered like automatically. So if you don't know that going in, ouch. <laughs> yeah. I, in, in the book, um, Note investing fundamentals. I, I, I came out with three pillars of note investing that I think is very significant in the space. The first one is mechanics. And that's actually how most people come into the space. They come in as, as the car mechanic, right? They want to learn. They want to buy a note. They want to vet the note. They want to, you know, work out the note. And, and that's, you know, doing the day-to-day -day operation. Uh, very few focus on identity and kind of setting up your business structure so that it operates as a business versus a sole proprietor. And the other one is community. So entrenching yourself in the right community or cultivating the community around you that's going to lead you to what your aspirations are. And so all those three pillars need to be worked simultaneously. And, and you have to have, you just have to have a massive amount of effort and you have to have access to capital to do it right, whether it's your own capital or someone, you know, who's partnering up with you, but it's not worth it. And the risk is very high when it's done incorrectly. Hey, Martin. So earlier when I asked, like, well, where would you go? Like you didn't mention the book, but now it sounds like I just picked up, you wrote a book on how to do this. Is that, is that right? I've written three books, um, three books okay. on note investing, and I just published a book, Cashflow Dojo, on building multiple streams of income for yourself, uh, and I published that in June. So I have five books that I've written in whole. And Aaron, you'll link to those yep. in uh, the show notes. And real quickly, where do people go to find those those books? 
Uh, you go to noteinvestingmadeeasier.com and and my books are there. And um, thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, great. Um, that's good stuff. Should we move on to the, uh, the, so due diligence, right? You're looking at the value of the property. You're looking at the other liens on the property. You're looking at the quality of the borrower to the degree you can, right? Like, so th- those are kind of the key the key pieces. And then what about the, like the note itself, like how it's written and the, the, yeah. the text in it, right? I like what just, it says. I was just going to say collateral review is, is significant. It's, it's actually the part that's, that's missed a great deal. It, you know, there's a lot more to collateral review than just are all the pages initialed and the document signed and notarized on the back end. There's, there's a lot more to the review process, but I'll let Ellis jump in on that if yeah, it's much easier for me because I'm I'm you know dealing with kind of a one-off note versus a bidding on a pool where there's you know you have a time frame well you know we're going to need your bid in you know 13 days and here are you know 300 notes you know now you have to have you know now you're you're kind of pouring through this stuff so uh, like a note that I just I bought uh, last month uh, you know you review the note you make sure it was. Uh, underwritten correctly, that it, uh, it has, you know, it, was it insured, you know, a lot of basic things like that, because you, the, you know, the soundness of the note is really going to affect the, the, uh, the value. And you have to have the experience to know, well, if there is a flaw in the note, how do you correct it? And what's the cost of correcting it so that it makes it a, a stronger note? And there's law firms that, that um, there's law firms and document preparation companies that will perform full blown uh, collateral reviews, and they'll provide you exception reports so you know everything that that needs to be um, cured. And and from that, you get to make a decision: Do I close and just put on there, you know, uh, you know, side agreement for for corrections to be made post close, or do I require some of the cures to happen, you know, prior to closing? But um, yeah, when you buy in pools, you need to have it professionally reviewed. That's the only way. That doesn't sound like something I could find on legal zoom. Where do I find those unicorns? <laughs> no, no. And then, and then there's also servicing comments too. So you have to have the, you have to have, you have to understand that, you know, the notes were serviced with a licensed servicer prior to your purchase. And so um, during the servicing process, you know, the bars have called in, they have given third party authorizations, they have, done payoff requests. They've told the servicer they don't owe the money. You know, all these comments, you need to have a a grasp on. um, They all need to be pulled together so you can analyze all the servicing comments to make sure that, um, you know, nothing's going to bite you post-close. Now, as a servicer, both of you guys have to comply with state rules when it comes to foreclosure, correct? Especially because it's owner-occupied. Well, we, I use licensed servicers, so okay. we partner with licensed servicers, yes. I don't know. Do you service all your own notes? I, I service them initially if they are uh, non-performing, and then once I get them performing, then I, I put them with a servicer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole nother process, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reviewing a lot of legacy loans from FHA and Fannie Mae and looking at all the stuff that they did. I. Speaking of, what's the legacy of some of the notes that you are buying? Are these stuff that hap- are these things that were originated before, you know, during the downturn, way before, newer? It's a mixed bag for me. I'm seeing a lot of like, uh, you know, notes that are just fairly recent, last few years, and then you know, once in a while I'll have, you know, someone that uh, uh, has had a note forever and ever, and it becomes inherited by you know someone else in the family. Just they just want to cash out of it, and uh, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, this is like a 15 year old note and it's going to mature in the next couple of years, but they just, you know, they just want out. Hmm. Martin, what about you from the hedge funds? What do you, what do you, what do you, what does a typical note look like? Who, who originated it? Where did it come from? So, um, you know, everyone, uh, you know, all the top 10 lenders, you know, Wells Fargo, Deutsche Bank, PNC, I, I'm, you know, city, you can just run down the list. We, we, we bought paper from all of them. And, mm-hmm. and so um, origination dates, you know, from 06 all the way to, um, you know, 2012, that time frame on average, the period of default is about four years on the notes we purchase. We actually um, look for notes that have, have a little bit of longevity with the default 
uh, uh, with the default periods, because if they don't, then we don't, that's our leverage really is, is to work with the bar and get them back on their feet is, is the past due interest arrears that's been accumulated. But also too, if a bar defaulted at some point, they had some life occurrence, right? Divorce or, or um, medical or, or love relationship, divorce. And so you want some period of separation between when that occurrence took place and when you're buying the note, because, you know, you know, you, you, you know, folks need time. Right. And so if you're buying it right after that occurrence, then it, it could set you up for failure, but a good four or five, you know, year period of time, we find that people are, are back on their feet in some capacity and, and have more ability to work with us. And then you just meet somebody who's willing to work with them, which is, so you coming to the table is awesome for them versus the guy that says, Hey, you're $30,000 behind, write me a check. You can come in and, and work that out with them in a way that's affordable. So that's a win-win. It's a legacy play. So we. Uh-oh. Oh no. We lost him. Hey, hey Alice. Hey, I'm here. Are, are, are you, um, are you preparing for distressed assets at all? Um, that's a great question. I, I think that there are, there is going to be a, 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 a distressed assets, but I don't believe it'll be the same as the last time. I think that, um, you know, I'm in a place where I, I, my intention is to build a war chest just to have more access to opportunity. You know, however, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to pass up good opportunities if I see them now. So if that makes sense, uh, there, there's actually something that came across me just, just last month where I was like, well, here's a note. It looks pretty solid, but I was such in fear of, well, what if I'm going to, you know, the fear of missing out? What if, what if I just raise cash and just, and just wait until next year? But, uh, you know, I thankfully have a good mentor. I said, what's, you know, what are you waiting for? This is a very good note. And so I went ahead and bought it and I'm glad I did. So you just, I think you have to have a very disciplined approach and, um, with just a little bit of caution, because I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of turmoil that has to be resolved. And I think it'll take a while before that happens. That's a really good point about the emotion and the FOMO. And what data do you look at to not be fearful when everyone's going so crazy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I look a lot at what type of volume is being done in the business, because like right now, and this is what I love about when I hear Sean speak, is that he kind of cuts through the the press and you know, all the the the, uh, the the pomp and circumstance. When you see prices going up, and it's on a low volume of real estate. That means something. That means something different than if there's a you know if if there's the regular type of volume with price increase. That's a much stronger market, right? But when you have limited volume and uh, the price is going up on that, you've you've got to be wary because that could be a false signal of things being appearing better than they really are. Interesting. Do you do you worry at all about like the hero program in California where, you know, you had these players that were putting sometimes really large loans on property tax roll? Are you catching those? Are you seeing that very often that because you have zero control that shows up six years late, you know, six months later when it gets recorded and surprise it pushes you from 70 percent combined loan to value to 90. Yeah, that is a horrible program. I cannot believe that actually. Yeah. Um. I do look out for those. I mean, if there is, uh, you know, if there's any recording of that on, on a, on a I, I take it particular attention to that and I have to come up with some sort of discount because it is kind of a wild card, right? That can be yeah. really bad. Because it affects the sales side too. Um, you have a lot of lenders that won't touch it unless that's paid off. Um, right just a little scary and that I always, I complain because we have a lot of originators that really got strong here in the Inland Empire. I'm like, if it's such a good idea, just go in a junior lien position. You're at hard money rates anyway. And right. they would just be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the true test, right? <laughs> yeah. Really uh, quickly, for folks playing at home, right? The hero loan is for certain, certain investments in your property and it basically jumps in front of all your other loans, which is just kind of a, a crazy, insane, like sets aside all precedent. Like it feels like it should be like not legal to just right, exactly. take a new loan for this thing and jump ahead of everybody who already made a loan. Right. The, the way the loans right. are supposed to work. If you get another loan, it goes behind everybody else. It's a lower priority. It's yeah. a crazy program, but it exists. 
Yeah, and it, I mean, it goes to the tax roll, right? So it's like, oh my god, how did they? How who who were the lobbyists that got that done? Because it was pretty powerful, right? Yeah, so, right. The taxes always get paid, right? Like, yeah. So and it's usually I usually went to some solar modification that happened on a house, yeah. and you'll see it, and you're like, uh oh. Martin, we're talking about in California the hero loan programs that attach to property taxes that. The, the first and the second, nobody knows it's going to happen until six months later when it gets recorded and it pushes your combined loan to value and you were never even notified. It's the it's after the fact. It's an after-the-fact loan that becomes super senior. Yeah. Yeah. Are, yeah. are you aware of those and how are you preparing for those? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I'd like, I think I'd like to hear Ellis's take on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get really nervous. I, luckily, I haven't run into too many where, you know, I have to take a, a position on that. But when I see it, I definitely try to find out, you know, is this something that, you know, if, if I paid it off, right, if I paid it off to protect my position. So I might put that in my I still have equity. Yeah, to protect my position, just pay it off. And then uh, if I can still buy the note with that payoff and be in a good position, then you know, so be it. But I think that's probably the only solution I can think of because it's a super priority lien. There's not a lot you can do. So so I'm just catching it midway. Is that something that will show up on an on a title pool? After, after the loan's been made, yes. But you could buy a note today and they could get a hero loan tomorrow and it would push your priority down. And you have zero control. Nobody calls you. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's there's another situation which is similar to that in Texas, for instance. There's uh, companies that are authorized by the state to give property tax loans. So for the uneducated eye, you'll see, oh, Martin got a property tax loan uh, after. So he's in second. He's in third position. I'm in second. So I'm good. But the state allows them to jump ahead of everybody. So you have to know <laughs> all these things, you know, state to state to understand. Involuntary subordination. <laughs> exactly. Do they notify? Do they notify you at least? No. 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 That's what's so upsetting. My my grandparents uh, became did this, and it's a really high interest rates, uh, and a lot of general contractors took it and ran with it, and they were charging seniors. It was gross, considering all the you know Dodd Frank stuff, CFPB, the ability to repay rules. I have no idea how they got around it. It's absolutely terrible. They've since like wound it down a little bit. It's not as aggressive, but I'm just shocked that it, it's just a, an extra layer of risk that our industry just, we have zero control over. So uh, I know- I'm going to let have you guys finish up on, um, you know, maybe the exit, the various exit strategies. I'm hoping you guys can chat about that a little bit. And, you know, I think we talked, touched on them briefly, but I'd love to hear a little bit more on that. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to drop. So okay. I'm going to leave that to you guys. And uh, thank you so much both for uh, coming. And uh, Martin, great to meet you. And uh, I'm going to pick up your books and, and check that out because new buyings. I've actually bought a couple and I've actually done a couple hard money loans. Uh, just more like helping friends out kind of thing than anything uh, serious. But uh, it's, I think it's a super fascinating uh, business and I look forward to learning more about it. And thanks for being on today to teach me a little more today too. And, and thank you to awesome. Ellis. So, all right, guys, have a great day. I'm going to drop and okay. uh, talk to you soon. See you, Sean. Bye. Thank you. It's so funny. We've never had a podcast with four being interviewed. and then, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's, let's get into the exit side. Is it your goal when you're going in that you're always just going to hold it until it pays off? That's always my intention. Okay. That's is fair. That, is that, uh, you know, if, if I want to hold this long term, that, that, you know, if I'm going to buy this note, I have to be willing to hold it long term. So, um, many cases you're, you're, you know, you're, if it's a non-performer, you're, you're renegotiating the terms so that it works for both parties. Um, other exits, I mean, you know, the uglier ways to do it are to actually foreclose, to do deed in lieu or the, you know, they, they say, you know, sayonara and give you the keys. Um, there's also, you know, a short sale that could happen. Um, and then, you know, the other obvious exits are you can also resell the note. You get it performing, you raise the value and somebody else wants to buy a performing note. Um, there's also, you know, the, the, uh, they, they actually sell the property in a normal sale or they refinance. Uh, I think I've covered many. There's probably more that, you know, the hypothecation I think is, is, I don't know if that's technically an exit, but that's more of a recapitalization. Mm. 
Yeah, I think you covered all of them. I would just say you could flip a non-performing note. You know, that's done. Those days are kind of a little behind us because, um, you know, uh, you know, no prices have gone up. So you don't have that ability to, to flip and double your money like like folks used to do um, 10 years ago. In short sale, I think you mentioned something, or you mentioned you know property sale, but short sales do happen, but they're happening less and less as e- people's equity positions are growing. So you're getting more full payoffs. Martin, are you are you being approached? Um, I was surprised uh, a couple years ago. I was approached by somebody that wanted to buy the the notes that we created at the Norris Group, and their goal was to package them up, take on leverage. So if I was originating at a nine, they were taking it down at a seven. So as the originator, I could keep a 2% spread. They were then taking on leverage, packaging them up and selling them as bond rated paper to pension funds. Are you getting a lot of pressure because the need for yield or to create those kind of assets? I, I don't even want to call them pools, leverage. Crunch, pool. yeah, it's like a yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, no, we, we don't, um, we don't go down that road much. And, uh, and it's just what we do is we just kind of focus internally on our model. So we actually don't um, coordinate or, or partner with other companies where we're buying performing debt or we're, we're securitizing the debt and reselling and working on spreads. So we work internally as a cradle to grave solution. It's the same thing Ellis said. We keep it till it pays off. So we get the loan in a non-performing state. Our asset managers work with the bar to create a payment plan that the bar can afford keeping them in their home. And once it's performing then, and it becomes seasoned, then, then we consider that note for a purchase into our income fund, which is a 506 C income fund um, that, that pays monthly dividends to our investors. So that's where we bring other investors into the equation. So, the, so, so before so, so it's really a long-term cradle to grave in that those notes, once they're performing, they still need maintenance and oversight. And that occurs by the same asset managers that initiated the loan modification originally. So there's a relationship that's cultivated with the bar that's very deep. And that's a very significant uh, component to our business versus it just being like, well, let me modify the loan and hand it off to someone that in across the country that, you know, I don't even know myself. It's the same person that modified it. If you have a problem, give Susie a call, you know, just like she, she helped you out initially. And, and so it, it helps. Um, it really just helps with, with consistency of payments. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a question while you, while you uh, re logging on, I, I asked Ellis this question. How do you get, how do you stay out of the fear? There's so much noise in the market, lots of stress, lots of talk about foreclosures. I get asked by the media all the time and I'm like, (laughs) what data are you looking at for to keep saying uh, confident that what you're doing is the right thing to do for your clients? Uh, You know, in terms of, in terms of, is it Is it inflation rate? Is it median home price? Is there any specific data that you're watching um, as the market progresses? I I look to buy consistently. So um, you know, what is dollar cost averaging in terms of investment? So we we look to buy on a consistent basis and modify loans on a consistent basis. And we look at those metrics very closely on a month by month basis. So if the market dips down, then note, there'll be an influx of note inventory and note pricing will go down. We're still going to buy in our consistent pattern. If, if the pricing, if it becomes, you know, fair market values are going through the roof across the country. So note pricing is going up because the quality of the asset you know, the value has gone up because there's more equity coverage back in the note. So, so we're still going to buy, we we're going to pay a little bit more, but we're still going to buy. So we actually don't, I pay attention to economic factors, but to me, it's more, I focus on internally and and the consistency of my process. Uh, Well, I've, I've, Shoot up an hour. I didn't go to all my questions per usual, but uh, if there was one site you'd like people to uh, run into you at, where would you send them, Alice? 
Uh, I have a, a note buying site called uh, thenoteguys.com, and that's where you can, uh, you know, you can find some information on me. Uh, I also have a, uh, a, a networking group called Four Investors by Investors, and you can, you can look uh, up on there too, Four Investors by Investors.com, and you can connect with me there. And I believe you guys will be having uh, some kind of event at the beginning of the year. We are. We're planning for a, a January event. It will be a, a virtual event obviously because of the the uh, situation but this will be our second one we're very excited to be putting that on so that was at the first and it was really really good <laughs> yeah thank you yeah it was what's really the name good. of that event ellis it's called the intelligent investors conference and can you you can post an ad on my facebook group so that oh, way okay. you come up yeah and i'll make sure to link all this stuff too and then martin what's the best way to uh, get in touch with you and find your books just go to noteinvestingmadeeasier.com and you can gain access to all my books. Awesome. All right, guys. Really appreciate you being here today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in this week uh, to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. Uh, next week, we have Doug Duncan, Chief Economist of Fannie Mae. If you would like to uh, find out some more information, check out our community at community.propertyradar.com. Uh, we have an area where you can ask questions. If you'd like us to cover any specific topics when we interview Doug, we'd love to have your input. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. Click that, join the community, and you'll be forwarded to the Property Radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there. We'd love to engage with you in the community, so check it out. Please don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show. It helps us out a great deal. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.